Today is the fourth day of our seven-day session, 2nd of November 2022, and we're going to take up another chapter in Subtle Sound, the Zen Teachings of Maureen Stewart, edited by Roko Sherry Chayat. And uh, this chapter is uh, entitled Peace of Mind. Bodhidharma was already an old man when he made the long three-year journey from India to China in 520 of our common era. And the story of what happened when he paid his respects to the Emperor Wu is well known. The Emperor thought of himself as a very good Buddhist. He had built monasteries, he had seen to it that sacred texts were transcribed, he had done many things that he considered exceptionally fine. But when he asked Bodhidharma about the merit due him for all of this, much to his shock and surprise, Bodhidharma said, no merit, none. The problem problem with all of Emperor Wu's efforts were that he was proud of them. There's a, um, a saying from the Tibetan tradition, um, something, something like this. Pride follows our good deeds like a ghost that never leaves. And of course, pride reinforces our sense of self. So it is diametrically opposed to what we're trying to do in practicing the Dharma, which is to erode our self-importance, to to wear it away, uh, to see through it. It's not just in Buddhism that that, uh, pride is seen as a problem have the saying in, in the West, pride comes before a fall. Rumi talks about pride as well. Right. He's talking about a poem uh, which has an image in it of a pickaxe. And um, Coleman Barks, who put together this anthology, uh, anthology, uh, um, comments on this this poem, which we'll read in a minute. He says, One view of identity is that it's a structure made of what we identify with. Rumi says that identity must be torn down, completely demolished along with its little tailoring shop, the patch sewing of eating and drinking consolations. In other words, eating and drinking for comfort. Inner work is not all ecstatic surrender. Don't listen too often, Rumi advises, to the comforting part of the self that gives you what you want. Pray instead for a a tough instructor, nothing less than the radical dissembling of what we've wanted and and gotten and what we still wish for allows us to discover the value of true being that that lies underneath. The pickaxe for Rumi represents whatever does this fierce attention work, clear discernment, a teacher's presence, simple strength and honesty with oneself. The pickaxe dismantles the illusory personality and finds two glints in the dirt. Like eyes, they are, but these jewel lights are not personal. Rumi points to a treasure within our lives, unconnected to experience. It is intrinsic, beyond calculation, a given, reached after the ego is cleared away and a one-pointedness digs under the promises. I think here of... um, one of the uh, koans in the, in the Hekigan Roku, uh, where Umon's, Umon says, Between heaven and earth, through space and time, 
there is a one treasure hidden in the mountain of form. This one treasure, what is it? To, to apprehend this one treasure, to, to touch it, we have to do this work of, of eroding our self-importance. Here's the, here's the uh, poem that this commentary refers to. Tear down this house. A hundred thousand new houses can be built from the transparent yellow carnelian buried beneath it. And the only way to get to that treasure is to do the work of demolishing and then digging under the foundations. With that value in hand, all the new construction will be done, without effort. And anyway, sooner or later this house will fall down on its own. The jewel treasure will be uncovered, but it won't be yours then. The buried wealth is your pay for doing the demolition, the pick and shovel work. If you wait and just let it happen, you'd bite your hand and say, I don't do as I knew I should have. This is a rented house. You don't own the deed. You have a lease, and you've set up a little shop where you make barely enough living, sewing patches on clothing. Yet only a few feet underneath are two veins, pure red and bright gold carnelian. Quick, take the pickaxe and pry the foundation. You've got to quit the seamstress work. What does the patch sewing mean, you ask, eating and drinking? The heavy cloak of the body is always getting torn. You patch it with food and other restless ego satisfactions. Rip up one board from the shop floor and look into the basement. You'll see two glints in the dirt. The pick and shovel work that has to be done. Demolishing our, our um, hard construction that the ego can be. Unyielding. Armour that we, we make for ourselves. She continues. If you do something for the sake of merit, there is no merit. The work you do inconspicuously that nobody ever knows you did is the work that is really the most meaningful. Think of um, Master Dogen, um, who in encouraged his students to um, undertake hidden acts of virtue. He emphasized that we should keep our good deeds secret and, and be public about our misdeeds. The, the reverse of what we would tend to do. We like to make ourselves feel important, good, and to hide our our shortcomings, but Dogen says, flip it round the other way. <laughs> Imagine what Facebook would would lose out if that people do that. The work that is not done for the sake of an expected reward, but for the sake of the work itself, for the sake of the next person who comes along is work that is worthy. When you go to the bathroom, you leave everything as clean, neat and orderly as you found it. If you didn't find it that way, you make it that way for the next person. That is true compassion. Think of those um, signs in, in airplane bathrooms. 
about using your towel to clean up. Uh, little did the airlines know that they were were uh, asking a question in the bodhisattvic spirit. We we uh, talk in Zen often on uh, our, about leaving no traces. This is a way of talking about this kind of um, thinking of the person who's coming after us or the people who are coming after us. And it's often on small things, little things like straightening up our cushions before we leave the zendo for at the end of an evening sitting or a morning sitting. But the the small things train our minds and uh, we build we build on that and that can affect how we respond to bigger things. After his encounter with the emperor, Bodhidharma went off to a cave among some impressive cliffs. He sat down facing the wall just as we do. There he sat for nine years. One day, during that time, along came Eka, that's Huayka in Chinese, who had heard about the strange blue-eyed monk from India. Although Huayka had studied the Chinese classics, knew Chinese poetry, had memorized the sutras, and had attended lectures by the dozens, just as most of us have, for all that learning he still did not have any peace of mind. So he arrived at Bodhidharma's place at Shorinji and asked to be taught. Uh, Shorinji, this is the the Japanized uh, name of uh, Shaolin Temple, which still exists. Um, I went there with Richard in uh, 2001, and um, Roshi was there many years before that. But it's mainly um, really now uh, a tourist attraction controlled by um, forces there, people there who are not Buddhist. What did Bodhidharma say? No, I won't teach you. The subtle and supreme teaching of the Buddhas can be understood only through, through doing what is hard to do and bearing what is hard to bear. How can a person of little virtue and much self-conceit dream of achieving this? Go away. So it was the classic Zen pushback. And, uh, of course, it's a test. Warren Stewart writes, what would you do if somebody said that to you? To this day, this test is used to some degree. Niwa Zume, the three days of sitting outside the monastery gate before being accepted, is a way of finding out what your intention is. Why are you sitting here? Why are you sitting in this session from dawn until 9 o'clock, or in our case, 9.30 in the evening? Clarifying, as we've said before in the session, clarifying our intention and and uh, knowing what it is can be very helpful when we we come up against obstacles. And this this um, niwazume is a, a kind of formalized obstacle. So the people entering the monastery. W- n- Know that they're going to have to go through this this um, extended sitting, being being uh, pushed back every time we try to they try to enter. Eka's intention, Huayka's intention, was quite strong. He stood in the snow and was rejected time after time, and finally, it is said, he cut off his arm. 
This is only a symbol, of course. It meant that he was ready to give up his life. My mind has no peace. Please help me, he begged Bodhidharma. There's also comments somewhere that um, Huayka, in his youth, um, was in a farming accident and had lost his arm then. But then, because of his, the, the strength of his character, much later in life, when he was, when he was an old monk, his, his missing arm was attributed to this encounter with Bodhidharma, which is plausible, given the way myth-making works. There was a truth to it, even if he hadn't cut off his own arm. There, there are accounts of people having to do this, there's, there was a film a few years ago about a guy who, in, I think it was New Mexico, he fell down a crevasse and uh, a rock, a large boulder, pinned him at the bottom of this crevasse um, and he, he, he hoped for somebody to come and rescue him, but nobody came. Um, he hadn't left word of where he was, pretending to go. And uh, at a certain point he had a dream and in the dream, he was holding a baby in his arms. And uh, this, this dream was one of the things that, that motivated him to do what he needed to do to get out of this, this situation. And what he needed to do was cut off his arm. There are also um, many recou- accounts of women giving themselves C-sections when uh, for some reason they're giving birth in isolation and and things aren't going as they should. So Hueka makes this, this desperate plea to Bodhidharma. He begs him. And then Bodhidharma responds. He can see that the time is ripe. So he says, bring me your mind, bring it here, and I will pacify it for you. And Hueko responds. And again, we don't know whether this was minutes, hours, weeks, or years later. I have searched for my mind, and I cannot take hold of it. And Bodhidharma says, now your mind is pacified. Or in our vision, we we have, I cannot find it. Where is the mind? What is it? We certainly have plenty of evidence of the functioning of the mind. We're we're conscious beings. We, We move and speak and open and close our eyes, hear things, smell things. There is no mind to find, no fixed condition. We cannot put the mind in a little cubbyhole and say, there, now I have peace of mind. We have all felt this yearning for inner calm, but nobody can help us, we must do it ourselves. We have to face our own inner demons. Nobody can do that for us. We have to deal with our grabby ego, continually trying to fix everything in some permanent condition, which prevents us from having peace of mind. We are convinced that our way is the right way, and therefore that nobody else's way is the right way, and so we become anxious, ill at ease, angry. Raising waves where there is no wind, as Mumon says in his commentary on this story from the Gateless Gate. It's the Mumon Khan. These these things she mentions, anxiety, um, uh, unease, anger, they are the evidence of our holding uh, tightly to a concept of self. That we that we uh, defend, often at all costs.
we try to um, soothe ourselves, placate ourselves, reassure ourselves. Uh, but all of this is shaky. And really superfluous, as Mumon says, raising waves where there is no wind. We, we put so much energy, energy into um, defending ourselves when that self is insubstantial. Sitting on the cushion, we are making arguments in our minds. What am I doing here? Am I doing this the right way, or am I wrong? Does she like what I did? Does he approve? We're raising waves, disturbing our minds instead of being so completely involved in what we're doing that we cannot have any second thoughts about it. Instead of just washing the floor or dusting the cushions, while we're working, we're thinking, oh, I have to go to work tomorrow. I wonder what my boss will say, and on and on. We use up so much life energy in this anxiety-producing mental activity, raising waves where there's no wind. One of the sort of paradoxes of of, uh, a seshin is that even though we're sleeping less and eating less, as the seshin progresses, we we find we can tap into great... um, reservoirs of energy and what one of the reasons why we I'm guessing that we our energy increases as the session goes on is that we're doing less rumination and we're actually freeing up a lot of uh, psychic energy for direct experience rather than than uh, rumination Dogen gave some wonderful advice about thoughts arising in Zazen. When a thought arises, be awake to it. When you are awake to it, it will disappear. After a long time, the associations are destroyed, and spontaneously there is a coming to one. This is one with a capital O. This is the secret of Zazen. We might um, these days uh, talk of, of neural pathways, but it's it's notable here that he he says when you are awake it will disappear, re- referring to the thought. But then he also adds, after a long time, the associations are destroyed, and spontaneously there is a coming to the one. There is this um, issue of habit, and. Um, you could say that we have, we may see through a particular pain producing behavior, um, but the pathway, the neural pathway for that behavior is still there. And the uh, character work that we have to do is, is the um, practice, having seen the, the, the pattern and wearing away that neural pathway so finally the associations in the in the brain are uh, dissolved and we we we're no longer um, pulled down that that um, pathway because it's no longer there because it's been deactivated but over time over a long time as he says here She continues, for example, we hear various sounds and our minds shift toward them. Without trying to suppress this shifting of the mind, we should inquire, what is this sound? Where did it come from? What is this idea? Who is thinking about it? In this way, we can become aware of the disturbances of the mind. By doing this over and over, thoughts and fantasies vanish. After a time, continuing this kind of meditation, not just for one or two days, but for years and years and years, the associations are destroyed. The subject and the object, which are joined by association, just disappear. 
The subject is the mind. The object is its counterpart, the Buddha field in which the sound is heard. Likewise, with what is seen, the seer is the subject and the seen is the object. As we continue this kind of awareness practice, the experience and the experiencer disappear. And the disappearance of these two is their spontaneous coming together through which we experience the one. In deep samadhi, Azazen is nothing but this oneness, gateless, gateless. It's a, a, a slightly funny turn of phrase. This oneness, this gateless, gateness. It is nothing but inner and outer, in-breath and out-breath, just this. We come to recognize that that inner and outer, in-breath and out-breath, are, are two sides of one coin, two phases of one process. Life is suffering, the Buddha taught, because we want some permanency, some guarantee. If we let go of this desire and just follow a path of doing finite things in an infinite way, then ordinary becomes extraordinary, secular is sacred. Preparing the food, washing the dishes, everything is a sacred act. That's um, why we have altars around the place. In the kitchen, in the, in the bath, just to to remind ourselves of how um, the the ordinary has also this dimension of a dimension of being extraordinary. The secular is sacred. This path must be followed without any shortcuts. Unlike instant coffee, enlightenment isn't bought in a jar. We must walk on our own two feet, alone. And when we come to the zendo to sit together for an evening sitting or a sesshin, we are loving, supportive companions for each other. This gives us more courage to go on alone. It is our own body, our own breath, through which we experience each moment fully. The effect that we have on one another is very strong. We feel our interrelatedness very clearly. So be mindful. What is your thought? What is your intention? It's it's very important that we come together together in this this loving spirit. Um, if, If we come with any kind of, of competitiveness in, our, in us, then that will um, sabotage our practice. Again, because it's self-referential. It's, it's, it reinforces our sense of separation. But if we, if we come together uh, in this loving and supportive way, then that stands us in good stead in our, in our solitary moments as well. We'll find that we can be uh, generous and loving towards ourselves and our, towards our shortcomings, not um, solidify them with our, with our fear and our judgments. She talks here about our interrelatedness and how we can feel this very strongly. <laughs> And not just those of us who are sitting here in the Zendo, but the online participants. This is something we've discovered over the pandemic, is, is how we can transcend distance and really feel part of something that um, is spatially scattered. Even when, when we may be well, almost all the, the online participants are um, sitting alone at home, uh, but then also even when they're um, sitting in their, their breakout room waiting for Doksan, the fe- there's a feeling of connection. There is a connection. 
or making this concerted effort together. There's a there's a um, Zen saying which which has been co- quoted often during the pandemic. Um, face to face, a thousand miles apart. Someone told me she has been finding it very difficult to follow the ten precepts. Of course it is difficult to follow this path unswervingly, but the three fundamental precepts offer very simple, very clear directions. Do no harm. Do good. Keep your mind pure and warm. This is an alternate third one um, in in the Theravada. The third one is keep the mind pure um, in the Mahayana, um, liberate all living beings. Um, but Maureen Stewart here, she, she it sort of melds the two together. Keep your mind pure and warm. That's, that's the bodhisattva element, to uh, include others in our practice. Keep them in mind and respond. When our minds are mushin, emptied out, that's no mind in Japanese, mushin, cleared up, then we cannot hurt anyone. We cannot really act in an inappropriate way because we feel our interrelatedness. We have to be a little careful about this because uh, we may think where our minds are emptied out and uh, think that that we can rely on that to act appropriately, but of course if we're thinking our minds are emptied out, they're not. Why are we here? Are we here for some self-improvement? Zen is not psychotherapy. Are we here warming and purifying our minds for the sake of all sentient beings? D.T. Suzuki once said, Buddhists have almost nothing to do with Buddha but very much to do with their fellow human beings. And the great Christian mystic, Meister Eckhart, a true Zen man, said, if a person were in such a rapturous state as St. Paul once entered, and he knew of a sick man who needed a cup of soup, it would be better to withdraw from the rapture for love's sake to serve him who is in need. This is the true Zen spirit, true bodhisattva spirit. We are not here to grab something, to get something. Zen insight is not our awareness, but the Buddha mind's awareness in us. So we we aspire to become vessels of the Dharma, and a vessel is something that dispenses as well as contains. And it's important for us to question ourselves as to to how we're doing that. How are we sharing this this treasure of the Dharma? Somebody once told me he was very embarrassed when complimented about his artwork. He became quite self conscious and didn't know what to say. I told him When somebody says to me, you play the piano beautifully, I say, yes, I do, thank you. I really do play beautifully, but I don't play. Something plays me. The more we come to the condition of emptied out, cleared up, warmed up mind, the more easily we can let go of the self-consciousness that makes us denigrate ourselves or worry about seeming conceited. We can be glad we can make something beautiful or play beautifully. We can be glad to share it with others and glad they like it. It is not conceited to say, yes, I play the piano beautifully. If I did not, after all the training, all the work, all the effort, it would be sad. But so it is with you. Each of you is the artist of your own life. You play your life beautifully. Hold up your head and be glad that you can offer whatever it is you have to offer freely. 
a little bell hanging in the emptiness sings. Each one of us is hanging in the emptiness singing. Sometimes lover, sometimes wife, sometimes husband, sometimes artist, sometimes friend, always with open, compassionate, wisdom minds. This is a beautiful image. I imagine those little bells that um, sometimes hang from the eaves of of temples, Um, wind bells, which um, the wind plays. We have some in our courtyard, or perhaps we have not got them anymore, but people know what I'm talking about. Hanging in the emptiness and singing, letting the wind pass through us. Another image that can be used for this this role playing that she's talking about is we we wear we put on different masks. We we take on a role, and really what we're called to do is live that role to the hilt. And then maybe in an hour or two we're playing a different role to so live that role to the hilt. Next um, chapter is entitled No Big Deal. Our Zen life is ordinary life. When we start adding things to it, as Nyog in Zenzaki said, it's like painting legs on a snake. It would be quite hard, I think, to get the snake to sit still while you paint the legs on it. But it's pointing to the fact that a snake moves beautifully. Yeah. What what use would a snake have with legs? Just to be ordinary is the most difficult thing. To be plain, to be simple, not to make a fuss about anything. This is our Zen life. To be the Rinzai's true person of no rank. Roshi Kapler used to tell a story of of, um, uh, answering the door one one Friday night when there was going to be a workshop the next day and um, letting in a workshop participant and then the next day when he was um, about to give the workshop and the sort of people were mingling beforehand, this person came up to him and said, I'm so sorry, I, I didn't know that you were the teacher yesterday when you let me in. I thought you were the janitor. And uh, Roshi Kapri used to tell the story, of course, saying that it was, it was the, the best compliment he could have received. Joshu, one of the greatest teachers, always used what was ever at hand. His teachings were along the lines of, have you eaten your porridge? Have you washed your bowls? Of course, when such ordinary acts are done thoroughly, completely, cheerfully, then they become extraordinary. Every single bite of porridge is tasted fully, but it is not done with the feeling of doing something special, There is no self-congratulatory inner voice saying, oh look, I'm such a wonderful Zen student, sitting long hours, doing everything so mindfully. We just do it, with no thought about it, whatever it is. To draw attention to what we are doing would be sickening, and it would have nothing to do with Zen. And and such a paradox, to be proud of our ordinariness, to be... be, um, Taking something that is just just as it is, and using it as a as a building block for our ego. We 
We just wash our bowls, washing away any excessive use of Zen terminology, any allusions to enlightenment. For our practice to become more ordinary, more real, we use words that everybody can understand. We refer to what is right here, right now. We sit, we walk, we cook, we eat, we clean, we have nosebleeds, and it's just here, right here, right in front of us, no big deal. This this, um, mentioning of nosebleeds, um, this was probably given this talk after she was um, quite sick, and she was... Um, having nosebleeds in, uh, when she was in Sishin. I think here also in her reference to language everybody under, can understand, and I think that's one of the hallmarks of her teaching is how accessible it is without a lot of uh, terminology Zen words. Um, there's been a real effort here at the centre to um, find uh, English words for various items in the Zendo, and um, so that we it's not giving the impression of Zen as, as some kind of uh, foreign, foreign, exotic thing. Practicing together is a wonderful, extraordinary experience, yet we are so much in it that we can't even talk about it. There is nothing to say. Every single act, everything we do, is the expression of our true nature. We may not know it. We may not be aware of it. We may not even think we have any insight, but everything we do is an expression of who we are. Standing up, sitting down, eating, drinking, laughing, crying, washing our bowls, especially if we do it unselfconsciously, especially if we do it unselfconsciously, but not only if we do it unselfconsciously. Even when we do it with our mind full of self-conscious storylines that we're telling us, still, our Buddha nature is shining, And we have never done any of it before. This is the first sitting, the first kenhin we have ever experienced. We are fresh, completely fresh, taking nothing for granted, with no ideas about what Zen is. Everything is seen as if for the very first time. Even though the Sishin schedule may be familiar to some of us, we are going through it with keen attention, really being present at each moment, really eating our porridge really washing our bowls. And when it's done, it's done. There's nothing to hold on to, nothing. She's talking, of course, here about uh, beginner's mind, which uh, has in itself lost a little bit of its beginner's luster and become a bit of a, a cliché, but still an important principle to come to everything afresh, To, to follow the guidelines, even if one's an old, old hand. To not make assumptions about our practice and what stage we're at and, and how things are going to unfold. Nor do we hold anything back. We don't think, next time things will be easier, I'll work harder. I'll be able to concentrate better. I'll do better. Right now is all we have. That's it. So be here. Let's burn up our resources unstintingly. When we think we have have something, we just forget about it. We start all over again, going deeper and deeper, never thinking we have completely understood. Sometimes people ask me, when did you finish your Zen training? I have never finished and there's no end to it. When we think we have attained something, we're in trouble. We need to wash away everything and become a beginner over and over and over again. 
this is why it, it, um, you can go back to uh, a fundamental koan and work, it, work on it again. We're never finished with mu. We're never finished with what is this. Um, just because we're starting later, Truman, I've forgotten where, what time it was when we started. Just wondering how much time I have left. Five more minutes. Five more minutes, thank you. A young woman once called me from California to tell me she had cancer. Very worried, very upset. She said, I am preparing to die. I said, how about preparing to live? They go together. And then I asked her, how do you know... Then I asked her, do you know any people who need help? She said, lots. I told her, well, you'd better get busy. Don't worry about that lump. Find somebody else to help. Later, it turned out that what this young woman thought was cancer was just a benign tumor. Um, Of course, sometimes it isn't a benign tumor. But the point she's making here is um, to not extrapolate. Maybe we're having really, really a lot of pain right now. But we, we pile more pain on top of that pain if we are imagining that we're doing permanent damage or that tomorrow it's going to be even worse because today it was so bad. We don't know. And it's, it's, there's no point in even contemplating it. When we let go of all our intellectual stuff, all our indirect and static knowledge, we allow ourselves to get in touch with the dynamic and direct intuitive understanding that we all have. And out of this comes real freedom, freedom to express whatever is in the moment. Like the burglar who locked his son in a chest as a way of teaching him his trade, a good Zen teacher puts the student in a box from which there seems to be no way out the student must find the answer in his or her own way. Um, this this um, putting the Zen teacher um, like, the, like the burglar who locked his son in a chest. It's a story from, um, from one of the masters. I think it was Fa Yen, no, Wu Tzu. And he told the story, and we'll just finish with this um, and then continue on with the the chapter tomorrow. It's it's a story that that Roshi's told told a number of times in in Taisho, and um, it's a way of... of, um, it's It's a metaphor or extended analogy for what what enlightened coming to awakening is like in in terms of how we how we learn the son of an aging housebreaker decided that it was about time for him to learn the profession to support the family so he had asked his father for lessons the father approved the proposal and took him along on the next attempt they broke in through a fence stealthily entered a mansion and opened a large chest the father suggested that the stum, the son step into the chest and pick out the valuables whereupon the son did. As soon as he got in, the father dropped the lid, locked the chest, sneaked out into the courtyard, loudly knocked on the door, waking the whole household, and quickly retired through the hole in the fence. The excited residents scurried around with their candles and discovered the thief had gotten away. 
Meanwhile, the son, imprisoned in the chest, was terribly afraid. An idea flashed through his mind. He made a scratching sound like a mouse, at the sound of which the master of the family sent the maid to investigate. When the maid unlocked the chest, out jumped the boy who blew out the candle, pushed the maid aside and ran off with the neighbours on his heels. Passing a well, he hit on another thought. He picked up a large stone and dropped it into the well with a loud splash. Hearing the sound, the pursuers all gathered around the deep and dark hole, attempting to see the burglar drowning himself. The boy ran on. Safely back at home, the youngster blamed the old man for the borrowing, for the harrowing ex- experience. Replied the father, understandingly, "Tell me, son, how did you get away?" Whereupon the son recounted the events in detail, and the father finally smiled and said, "There, son, you have now learnt the art of burglary." We'll stop there and recite the four vows. Uh-huh.